Hello, this video is about the phone testing setup. This is a system I've been working on for the last two months. And it is a system for automated testing of post smartwares devices. Automated phone testing is not something that's easy to get running. And we have some virtualized tests for post smartwares, of course, but a lot of things need to be actually verified against real hardware to check that kernels are working, for example. In this readme, you can see what the general components of the test setup are. There's the central web application, that is the public web UI. It connects through the internet to the controller computers, which have some Raspberry Pi Picos connected to it, which control the buttons on the phones. This uh, whole test setup is based off quite a lot of different repositories because there is the, the central controller application here, the daemon that runs on the controller, the firmware for the Raspberry Pi Pico, the parser for the custom job description language, the 3D printed components of the system, some administration utilities, and in this case, the readme repository. This was quite a large project to take on and I was able to get this all done thanks to some funding from NLNet, specifically the NGI Zero Fund. It's, uh, the details of this is listed in the bottom of the readme for all the associated projects for this whole system. It's amazing. I've been able to work on a relatively large open source project through this whole funding system. So let's have a look at the actual web interface. This is the central controller application. It's a Python Flask uh, web application that uh, implements this public dashboard that does not list any running jobs because there's no running jobs. There is this device list, which currently contains one Pine phone and one enchilada, uh, which is the OnePlus 6. And at the moment, the OnePlus 6 is marked disconnected because it's not actually connected. This is the job history. It lists every submitted job for the whole system and every job contains a task for every device that was selected. In this case, only a single task. And if I click on this, it will show the actual serial port output of the device while running this task. The backend will automatically split up the serial log so it can be browsed through quicker and it will insert log messages for all USB activity of the phone. And here it will go through all the bootloader messages because it will first boot it into flashing mode, then flash whatever image needs to be tested, reboot it again by holding a few buttons and then boot into it. Here, it, this is the log after the first successful boot. It uh, goes through a few kernel messages, but because this is a very minimal installation, there's not a lot of output. The actual CI commands are these. It will first use export to set some environment variables. And in this case, it runs a testing script that will uh, put the device to sleep and check if it wakes up again. If I've opened the manifest, this is the custom format that was designed for this. It's pretty simple. It's a bit nicer to work with than inserting shell scripts into YAML. The first line selects all devices of a specific device type. In this uh, case, it's the Pine phone and there's only a single Pine phone. It will then use the boot block to download an image from the web and flash it to the device. And then the last block is the actual script that will run. So if I log into the web interface, you get the admin panel. And there you can see the definitions of the, the current devices. Another important system is the variable system. And to make the system actually do something, there is the controller system. In this case, only my single controller is listed. The variables uh, define uh, global variables in this case that are available as uh, environment variables in the shell scripts and also as substitution variables for the manifests. This can be used to set some global variables like what CI platform the script is currently running in. I can also go to the device type and go to the Pine phone uh, device type and add a variable here. And this can define new variables or override 
uh, an existing one from the global variables. Let's add another one here, like the device tree, which can be used in maybe the manifest to select which device tree to link to the kernel. This is not used yet in production. This is also not the correct path for a PinePhone device tree, but it will do for an example. Now the brownish yellow lines here are the variables. If I go to the device then, and PinePhone 1, I can add an override of this device type variable for this specific device, like the device tree, because PinePhones have multiple revisions, so this can be the 1.2 revision of the PinePhone. And now you can see that it is a green line in the device variables. And that shows that this uh, device specific variable and the yellow one is still the device type specific one. Global variables will also be listed here and those will be red. And the last component here is the actual controller list, but I cannot click here because it will show the, the private API key for my controller in production. The reason that the last test run here was three weeks ago is because the controller is broken. The reason the last test here was three weeks ago is because the controller PC I'm using in the test setup is broken. I reused a 10 year old board I had laying around, which worked fine for development. And after 14 tests, it just stopped working. So let's have a look at the hardware. This is the controller computer that is broken. And this is the box that holds the phones. I have not screwed this down, so we can just take it out and remove the annoying screws from it. These are nice and cheap boxes, but they are definitely not uh, quick to open up. So here are the phones in the system. And this is the two phones, the Pine phone and the OnePlus 6. And currently the OnePlus 6 is not connected due to a lack of USB ports. So if I move the camera here and focus it. You can see that this is still quite a bit messy. That's because this does not use some nice PCBs yet, but this is all prototyping on perf board and solder together things. These phones are removable by sliding them out of the base plate. And you can see the Raspberry Pi Pico on the device. And it's a bit of finagling, it is possible to slide it back in. These phone holders are all 3D printed parts that are also available in the Git repository. I'm not the best 3D modeler in the world, but this uh, model works good enough for the test setup at least. It slides the phone into the base uh, plate with some dovetails and the holder has some clamps that fit around the front and back of the phone. And then I use some double sided tape to make sure that the phone cannot slide around into this clamp. And then on the back, there is a plate with screw holes that fit a Raspberry Pi Pico exactly. There still needs to be a power management PCB made that will control the power to the USB port of the phone and possibly emulate a battery so I don't have to have a rack full of lithium cells. The base plate for the phone is also 3D printed and is designed to fit exactly into this off the shelf rack case. But the issue is the computer here. The USB ports on it have died and it already did not have enough USB ports. So I ordered a replacement part. It's from the same manufacturer, uh, but it is a way newer board. I think I've had this board for almost 10 years now. It used to be a NAS in my office. I basically got the cheapest passively cooled uh, ITX main board I could find, which is some Intel Atom board, but the controller PC does not really need any significant CPU power or main memory. It basically only needs to control a few USB ports and send some serial commands. All the hard stuff is running on the phone itself. The system was designed that it should be possible to get something like a Raspberry Pi to run a whole controller off. Like the main limitation for the controller is the USB bandwidth it has. In the final design of this test rack, 
there will be a 16 port USB hub into the case of the phones itself and it will just take up a single USB port on my controller computer. And the system uses two USB ports per phone so I can hold eight phones in this case. So this is the new board that has been booted. Now we need to go through the basic setup of this new board. There's uh, some things that need to be changed like making it automatically boot after power loss since my uh, ITX rack case does not have any power button on it. Also some general setup like making sure that a secure boot is off and that the fan control is set to not run all the fans at max speed all the time. And now it's time to reboot into the actual operating system running the controller. In this case it's all by Linux. The controller software does not depend on the distribution in any way, but since it's for postmark tests, it makes sense to run Alpine on the, the desktop hardware or actual server hardware in this case. Well, it should not have opened the BIOS again, it should have booted. It turns out that this board does not have support for legacy booting anymore, we can only boot from EFI and my current Alpine installation on this uh, SSD is only for legacy booting. My last hope for this is that a BIOS update will add back the legacy booting option. So that's what I did. So this is one of those new fangled mainboards that can automatically update itself over the internet. It's uh, a lot easier than figuring out how to update the mainboards from Linux. But the issue here is that it does not work. In this case, I'm updating from USB stick again. The internet flash option does actually seem to connect to the internet. It gets some DHCP lease from my router and then it fails without any debuggable error, just connection failed. The BIOS also does not give any way to see the network information that it has connected or what IP address it has. Or it's very minimum here. So, well, at least USB updating works. And if I press enter, the system should work, hopefully. The change lock for the BIOS is also very minimal. So I don't know if this brings back the legacy booting option. What's not pictured here is the fan spinning down and the computer resetting, which makes sense after an update. And it's still not booting. So as you can see from the lighting change, this took quite a bit to get working. I booted from a live Alpine ISO and converted the installation from a legacy booting system to EFI booting. The system already had a boot partition and then a swap partition and then the main root FS and I reformatted the system to have the first partition be an EFI partition, the swap partition is now a boot partition and root FS could stay in place. With LS plug it is possible to see the connected USB devices and it shows that it has a postmark test test device which is the Pi Pico. With the dash D option it is also visible that it produces two serial devices. The phone itself is not visible yet because it is not booted. I need this USB information because the USB port, in this case 1-6, is the port that goes into the configuration file for the controller software. All the configuration for the controller software depends on USB port numbers. There is never any device names configured anywhere. The controller will use UDEV to figure out which devices are on which port and then link together the right uh, serial devices to the running controller instance. This is to make sure that the test system does not depend on any device names that are random based on the plug order of the kernel. I now plugged in the USB stick uh, into the port that is for the phone so I can actually see the port number and that is 1-5 in this case. So all I need to do is adjust the config file for the controller. The controller config file is pretty simple. It's an ini file that has the secret in it that I need to block out now. 
and it has the port numbers for the device and some basic flashing information. All the other things are handled by the web interface. Now I just need to restart the controller software instance for the Pine phone in this case. And then the setup should be running again. Let's check the log file that is produced by the controller. The system uh, spawns one daemon per device into the test rack. So it is uh, relatively easy to uh, restart uh, to reconfigure a specific device without stopping any test jobs on all the other devices. So this is a lot of output, but the main important thing is that it has found the serial ports and connected it to the right phone into the test rack. So this is uh, all that needs to happen for the controller software. So this concludes my look at the phone test setup. It uh, still has a few things that need to be fixed up, like having a proper PCB for power management, having USB hubs, uh, integrating this with Postmarked West CI and write some actual test cases for it. Hopefully other projects can also make use of uh, all this software that has been written. Nothing in this at all depends on running Postmarked West on the test devices or anywhere else. It is designed to be generic. I will put the links to all the components down into the description. Um, thanks for watching.